campus. And welcome, 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 welcome to HIM 480, the capstone, your long awaited, most probably last course. <sighs> it's not my last course. It's not Yay. your last course. Okay. <laughs> So Almost like, close to your last course. Yeah. <laughs> Let's hope it's not your first course, because then you're going to have a problem. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Somewhere in there. Okay. Oliver, this is not, you're not a guest speaker tonight. Okay. Oliver is my Yorkshire Terrier. He likes to get involved in things. Okay. So I'm so happy that you are here. Um, this is kind of new for us. And uh, first, I want to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Shelley Safian. And we are doing joint live chat with the other section of HIM 480 and the instructor, Ms. Uh, Flag, Katina Flag, is here as well. So you have two faculty members here eager to guide you to success on the RHIA, which is the primary focus of this course. Isn't that great? This yeah. course is not about learning anything new. It's about rechewing what you already know or what you should have already learned. Oops, right? Okay. To get you ready to answer all the questions on the RHIA, perfectly nobody's ever gotten 100 on this exam by the way the only thing we care about is passing which requires 75 percent okay all right the point is that um we're going to help you this is really a great opportunity for you to be able to add this to your resume and your collection of credentials Okay, um, and I just wanted, for those of you who are not familiar, www.ahima.org, okay? That's the American Health Information Management Association. You all should be familiar with this. And I'm going to mention it again and again and again and again. Um, you all should become student members of Ahima. It only costs $49. And the minute you apply to take the RHIA or any other exam, um, you automatically get a $50 di discount. So even if you do nothing else, the membership pays for itself with the exam fee. But, but, but there are many, many more benefits to an AHIMA membership. It is highly regarded um, associate, excuse me, association in our sector of the industry. Remember, they sit at the table with CMS and the National Health Center for Statistics in creating, monitoring, overseeing ICD-10 CM and ICD-10 PCS and HICPICS level two. So they are part of the creators as well as an organization that has a lot of power and a lot of say in the healthcare industry. And um, they really have a lot to offer you as a member, not excluding the state chapter membership, which is included in your national, and most areas have a local um, chapter that has meetings. You go, you get some free food, and you meet people who like want to hire you. Uh huh. Okay. Um, having an RHIA on your resume will increase the job opportunities. It will. It, it will increase your opportunity to be hired, decrease the time it takes you to get hired, and increase the salary at which you are hired. Okay. There is no downside to this. It is a feather in your cap. Once you sit for the exam and pass it, um, 
you never have to take it again. You just have to do the CEUs every year, which is easy peasy. Okay. All right. So before I continue on and on and on, as you can see, I'm very shy. Um, but Ms. Flagg, would you like to say something to our students? Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our first conjoint, uh, yeah, conjoint sessions. We are excited to have you all joining sessions and learn more about your RHIA certification. The one thing I want to share with you is please do not have test anxiety and wait for a very long time to complete your national certification exam. Please complete it as soon as you possibly can. And the reason I'm saying that is because I had test anxiety and I took three years to sit for my certification exam. So that's not ideal at all. You forget a lot of things and the it's like hot off the press. Take it. It's not that bad. I promise you. And I just want to say welcome and thank you for joining. Fantastic. And not only is that Ms. Flagg's personal experience, it has been proven by research that those students who sit for the exam within three to six months after finishing this course have a more than 20% higher pass rate. That's pretty big advantage, okay? Also, I want to let you know that even though this is an exam that requires you to have your bachelor's degree, you do not have to wait to graduate before you sit for the exam. I will, or Ms. Flagg will, and actually it's going to be Dr. Lynn Ward, our dean, who will provide you with what's called an early testing permission slip, which basically says you are an active student in our program, and they will let you sit for the exam as soon as you're ready, which should be in about eight weeks, okay? Um, and uh, then once you actually graduate, they will ask you to send your, your final transcripts. But you do not have to wait for that official moment in time, no matter what the website says, okay? All right, before we start covering the first week of information, do, do any of you have any questions you wanna ask? Okay. Um, whenever you think of them, jot them down in an email and send it to either one of us. That's the one thing great about email, right? It's right on your phone and you can send it to us. We'll answer within 24 to 48 hours. And that way you will have the answer to your question and you won't forget. And it's very important that, that you seek you seek to understand the concepts in a logical way in your head, as opposed to thinking about memorizing. There'll be some things like the formulas that you will have to memorize, but for everything else, you need to understand the material logically, have it make sense in your head. You see, that's my assistant, Roxy. Yes. If you have any questions that I can't answer, she can answer them because she has attended every one of my lectures. Okay. So um, the bottom line is, is this exam is all multiple choice. When you understand the concepts and they make sense to you, you'll be able to figure out the answer. Okay. So that and the and that knowledge will carry with you into your career and, you know, you'll become the uh, vice president of health information management or whatever you desire. This is true. OK. We'll talk more about your career goals later. Let's get on to some hot information like you have to know what the content of a patient record is. And this has not changed. P 
paper or plastic, paper or digital, it doesn't matter. The, uh, the patient record must contain these or typically will contain physician documentation. Those are the encounter notes, right? Nursing notes, medication records, lab and pathology test results, radiology reports, immunization records, and mammography records for the women. Okay. Uh, wow, you're a tough crowd. Not even a smile. That was all right. That wasn't one of my best jokes. I'll work on it. All right. You'll notice that all of these things are appropriate both inpatient and outpatient. So you don't have to concern yourself with that. Um, once you look at what goes into the patient record, you can understand that every part of this is a piece of PHI. Who knows what PHI is? Say it. Okay. Oh, people don't have their microphones on. Protected okay. health information. Thank you. Protected health information. Absolutely. And from all, and now thanks to EHR, electronic health records, or EMR, electronic medical records, there really is a difference, but I'm not going to bog your brains with the difference because anyway. All right. The, the bottom line is, is thanks to computers, we can now collect all of this individual data from within all of these documents, the results of the testing, the opinion of the radiologist, the physician's documentation as to how the patient is feeling, the nurse's notes with vital signs, all of that can be pulled out and analyzed, which has tremendous benefit with once what we do with the results of that analysis, okay? Remember, HIM, our jobs are to collect data, store data, protect data, and make it available when it needs to be, whether it's for analysis by a physician seeing a patient again, or whether it's because we're going to run a report on the patient outcomes of those who come into our clinic with type 2 diabetes. Okay, we have all of that and knowledge is power. You already know that. Okay. All right. Ask questions when you have them. So I'm not going to stop at the end of every, every slide and say, do you have any questions? Unless you want me to say, do you have any questions? Do you have questions about what to do with your questions if you have questions? Okay. All right, we're either having fun and you're going to laugh at my jokes or we're not going to do this because otherwise it'll be boring and I don't do boring. All right. This is one of the trickiest questions you will may find on your RHIA exam. And I say will may find because the RHIA, just like all of Ahima's exams, are computerized. Basically, what they have loaded in the computer are a bunch of test bank questions for each domain. And when you sit down at a computer to take this exam, your computer will randomly choose questions to total the proper amount of questions, which is why when you look at the RHIA domain list, on the website, you'll see that one particular domain may cover um, 15 to 20% of the exam. And that's because we don't know what questions you're going to get or how many in each domain. It's a very fluid thing. I will tell you, for example, when I was preparing for my RHIA, I had a study buddy. I live in Florida. She lived in, in Louisiana. And we used to get together and, and study. And my background, I came into this as a, 
a coder, a medical coding uh, specialist. And her background was actually law and policy making in healthcare. So it was great for the two of us when we were studying because we would go, oh, that's your area of expertise. Help me answer this question, okay? We get to the test. I took my test a week before she did. Um, I had three coding questions on my RHIA, three. She had nine. So there's no way to predict. So that's why I say it's important that you just understand things logically. All right, so patient record retention is a challenging question because of what you see on your screen. Okay, right? You see five years, you see seven years, you see whatever each state wants it to be. Okay, AHIMA recommends 10 years. Now, the good news is this is not as much of an issue now with EHR because you know how much information you can get on a DVD versus a pile of folders with paper records. So this used to be more of an issue because of storage capacity. What you wanna remember here is CMS says five years for minors, pediatric patients, five years after majority. So that's the age of 23. The age of majority is 18, okay? Medical malpractice law says at least seven years. I think you always want to like live by the lawyers, right? Okay. But states, again, have different requirements. New Hampshire, for example, home of hmm, Southern New Hampshire University, they say seven years. Seven years after a patient's discharge or seven years after majority, but they consider majority 19, not 18. Okay, so what I would jot down in my notes is minimum of five years, AHIMA recommends 10 years. And then just pray that this question is not on your exam. Okay, all right. Record destruction, big, big deal. Destruction logs must be maintained and they must identify exactly what is being destroyed, when it's being destroyed, when it was originally created, the method of destruction, individual responsible for the destruction. Now, I think that would be a cool job. Okay. And you got to have a witness to the destruction. Why? Because of PHI. You got to protect it. You can't just take patient records, even on CDs, and throw them in a in a in the trash. Now, CD drives can be shredded, and I think I have the yes. Okay, so methods of acceptable destruction include shredding, burning, hmm, bonfire. No, we're coming into summer. You don't want to do a bonfire in summertime. Incineration pulping, and digital records, you can use a degausser, which basically scrubs a, a server or a, um, a motherboard uh, or physical destruction. So if you're frustrated, you could take that motherboard out there into the parking lot, get a good sledgehammer, right? And plus, it's very good exercise for your pecs and and your your arms okay thank you all right spoliage i spoliation i wanted to include this because when i was studying for my rhia i remember i thought this was spoilage you know kind of like when you accidentally you know, tip over a cup of coffee on a patient record that's paper or something that's not what it is it's the destruction of documents that are required for legal discovery. But we must remember that all patient records are legal documents. 
So you have to be very careful before you do the destruction thing to make sure that none of the documents you are seeking to destruct are involved in any kind of litigation or within that seven years with the possibility of litigation, okay? But again, as I said before, um, with digital records being so much easier to store, uh, it's not as big a deal as it used to be with regard to getting rid of the old and making room for the new. Okay. All right. This is good because I can see you all and you're still awake. That's fun. All right. Now, I tend to talk quickly and I'm sure it has very little not to do with the fact that I was born and raised in New York City, Brooklyn. OK, if I'm talking too fast, please let me know. You can send me a little private chat thing. OK, and if um, if you uh, if you um, no, that's all. If I'm talking too fast, just let me know and I can slow down. But because this is a review and the expectation is that nothing that we discuss in any of these live chats is going to be an aha moment, then there's no reason to dwell and linger on them too long, unless you want to, in which case you can ask, okay? All right. Access to uh, EHR is very, 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 very important. As you know, um, this is included in the privacy rule. It's also covered in the um, uh, security rule with regard to the safeguards, because this has to do with not only to whom are you going to give permissions, but what level of permissions, and that's part of the security rule. Now, this website here, and or you can just go into Google and Google uh HIPAA privacy rule summary. This document is fantastic for studying. Okay. It's only six pages long and it really just chunkifies the privacy rule. It's very easy to read. Do you want to go down? Okay. It's very easy to read and understand. And um, it's a good way for you to brush up on the requirements of HIPAA's privacy rule. Uh, so it's an excellent handout for you, if you will. Although I was reminded that because I'm not handing you anything, it's not technically a handout, but I don't know what the digital version of this is. So deal with my old age. Okay, all right. It will cover required disclosures internal use policies and procedures. Don't forget the privacy rule, uh, the acknowledgement of the privacy rule policies that all patients must sign, everything. It's really very good, especially for the, um, the optional disclosures. There are six permitted optional disclosures that are stated in the law to be based based on the healthcare provider's best judgment, whatever that means. All right. Okay. Release of information, ROI, not to be confused with return on investment. This is our HIM ROI, release of information. And you need to understand that there are three types of consent. Express consent means you are signing or the patient is signing specifically, I agree to let you disclose this. Every one of you have probably signed one of these uh, when you go to a new doctor, giving them permission to disclose things to your insurance company so the insurance company will pay, okay? Um, all of those forms you have to sign, uh, that's express. When you sign your name and date it, that's express consent, okay? 
Then we have implied consent, which is evidenced by a patient's behavior. So in other words, a patient walks into a hospital emergency room or a doctor's office. They go into the exam room. That is implied consent to treat, but only to a certain level, okay? Um, and then there's informed consent, which is required by law, which has six requirements describing the proposed procedure, service, or treatment, the benefits of having the procedure, the risks of having the procedure, the benefits and risks of not having the procedure, discussing alternatives to the proposed intervention, such as a medication regime, acupuncture, um, uh, chiropractics, whatever. And then the physician has to not only note all of this, but also note that the patient was cognizant enough to make this consent informed, understand what they were talking about and consent, okay? Now, essentially informed consent is only done for major procedures. You know, if a physician is gonna give you a flu shot, you definitely do not need to sign a consent form, although it probably would be covered in your consent to treat, okay? But your job as HIM professionals are required to know all of the different types of consent and make sure that there is a record of this in the patient's chart. Authorization to disclose PHI. This is a form, and this is what the patient will sign to say, I would like a copy of my records to be sent to, okay? You may have done this yourself, or you may have been involved in this in wherever you may work, okay? Um, the form is required to have these six details, patient identification, from whom the information should be released. So for example, I am going to authorize Ms. Flagg to release my test results to my boss, Dr. Ward, okay? So you have to have the from and the to specific types of information. And most of these forms have little check boxes like all patient records, uh, no psychotherapy notes, because that has to be separate, as you may remember. Um, psychotherapy notes uh, have different rules because the physician has to approve this disclosure, not only the patient, okay? Um, dates, the authorization is valid. It must have an expiration date. And of course, the patient's signature, authorization, and date, okay? All right, and this website, you can actually see one of these forms. This is an example of an authorization to disclose PHI form from CMS, because I find, okay, you're gonna talk to me about required pieces of information, I like to look at the actual form and say, oh, okay, all right, that fits in with me. Okay, now I understand. Okay. The purpose of the health record is important for you to understand because you'll notice in this list of six reasons why we need health records, reimbursement is not the first, it is the last. Continuity of care is the first most important purpose for the health record, because if the next physician is coming along to, to care for this patient, they have to know all the things the previous physician knows, knew, 
okay? This is also becoming much better uh, with HIE, health information exchanges. Again, another wonderful benefit of electronic health records, okay, is the ability to share. And I think you're going to talk about that next week or in week three. Okay, future ongoing clinical decision making. Ongoing, if you have a patient scheduled for, you know, two month treatment plan, you have to have information in the record as to how the patient is doing on this treatment plan. So you know whether you need to extend it, whether you need to stop it early, or if it's working or what, okay? And the only way this is happening is when it is in, stop baby. Did you wanna say something to the group? No, he's so shy. Okay. Um, the only thing is um, when I say written down, I mean typed, okay? So can you just make that adjustment in your head? All right, okay. Utilization management, very important for the entire facility to make certain that the facility is running at its optimal. And one of the things you may be familiar with is uh, the nursing shortage, okay? So if I have 10 nurses and I go ahead and schedule five of them in um, labor and delivery, maternity care, and then I have uh, two of them in cardiology and two of them in trauma, and then we get notification that there is um, a five car pileup on the interstate. We need to know this so we can move those, as long as we don't have patients in labor, move them to trauma. And on a longer basis, okay. Legal support, the health record, the patient's health record is legal documentation. It is admissible in court as evidence, which means you don't mess with it. That's one of the things you already know, right? Is you never erase anything. You can't take something out. You can amend it or correct it, but you got to leave the mistake in there while you're correcting it, okay? And medical research and education, I can't tell you what a godsend it has been. Um, back in the olden days, 2005, 2006, I got the best gift from a friend of mine who was director of health information and health information management at a local big hospital group. Three boxes of redacted patient records. I use them in my classes in teaching coding. I use them in my class and I use them in my books. Okay. So Yes, education, because that's how people learn. Scenarios, you know, that, that's part of real life. And when you can actually get it from real life, it's super better, okay? All right. Um, health record content is going to include past and present signs, symptoms, diagnoses, all procedures, treatments, preventive, diagnostic, and therapeutic. This is so important. And again, now, thanks to EHR, we can, and through the health information exchange, people of this generation, people who are born now, your children, your grandchildren, you can start to build a longitudinal health record. In other words, from the day they're born, everything will be documented and clearly detailed. And we all know how important this is for future healthcare, okay? If you ask me if I got vaccinated, the best I can do is sometime around when I was five because you needed it before you went into school, right? I couldn't tell you a date or this specific vaccine that I got, um, my pediatrician's name was Dr. Katzman. Okay, that's, yeah, in Brooklyn, New York. That'll really get you some good information. 
All right, there's probably about 17,000 of them. All right, so my point is, is that technology has really, really helped us in pro 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 protecting and keeping this information so that your child or grandchild who was born last month, when this child is 25 years old and seeing the doctor for some weird thing, the doctor could actually see everything from all the doctors. Oh, that's an allergic reaction. I see you have allergies. Okay. All right. Included in health records is PFISH, what we call PFISH, past, family, and social histories. So past, you used to have this, but you don't have it anymore, but you did have it, okay? Family, I don't have it, but my mother had it. And social, I no longer smoke. I don't drink that much and whatever else might be involved in that. And rock climbing, I live in Florida, so there aren't really any mountains or anything to climb. All right, recommendations for future care and treatments. Very important for the doctors in the future to know. And of course, those glorious consent forms. Are you just like all cruising in your heads? Is this stuff at least familiar to you? Are you inside your heads? You going, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. All right. All right. Get with it every day. Excellent. That's the best way to remember something. Okay. Versions of health records. You have your SOAP notes, subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. You have your problem-oriented medical record. Oh, and this reminds me, while being a professional in healthcare requires you to know an inordinate number of abbreviations and acronyms. But the test will not use them without their definitions being there. So you don't have to worry about in the, in the stress of the moment, remembering what POMR is, okay? All right, and longitudinal, which I mentioned before, birth to death, multiple providers enabled by, brought to you by your local HIE. How lovely is that? It is really an incredible advance. We need to advance it further, but another time. All right, this is important for you to know as well. Data, information, and knowledge. Data is a character with no meaning. So I'm just going to say um, the number 103. Who can tell me what that means? Right, you can't. Information is when I add meaning to that data. So now if I say 103 degrees, that tells you, right? Now you go, okay, this patient has a fever, okay? If it was 103 and I say, it's at the bottom of two numbers, 145 over 103, now you know it's dis dis diastolic blood pressure, right? So basically information is data that is put into context, it's given meaning. And knowledge is the ability to use that information in context. So if we know that the patient has a fever of 103 degrees, the physician now, now reads that information in the chart and orders an analgesic. Okay, does that make sense? That's how that fits together. Data quality, this is really important. These six items are identified by AHIMA as the um, qualifications or the measures of the quality of the data that you are collecting. And you, 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 you are all responsible 
for making sure that the data that is being collected, stored, protected, and analyzed in your facility meets all six of these qualities. Okay, quickly, accuracy. Well, right, <laughs> that's kind of a like, yeah, what good is data <laughs> that's not accurate? Thank you. All right, completeness. It's got to be the whole story. You can't just have half of it. It's just like, just like d data without information. It's not helping you. Um, just like a diagnosis of pneumonia. Okay. You can't do anything. No matter who you are, you can't do anything with that information, right? I know you're upset. It's okay. The patient is imaginary. The, you have to know whether it's bacterial, viral, fungal, or environmental. You can't treat, you can't prescribe any medication without knowing that. You can't treat this patient. You can't help make this patient better without knowing that. Consistency. Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. Line one has to agree with line three. Timeliness. You know, you tell me that the patient has a contagious disease. Oh, this patient is COVID positive. Well, you know, it would have been good if you would have told me that yesterday before we discharged the patient. Okay, time matters, currency matters, and currency matters in your education, in your knowledge, okay? What was correct and accurate in 2016 is not necessarily correct and accurate in 2022. Really, really important. As you study for this exam, open the front of that textbook and find out what year it was written. Make sure that you know where your information is coming from and when it was collected. Really important, okay? A friend of mine um, is working on uh, a, another book for Cengage. And uh, she informed me, y'all know what the joint commission is, right? Yes, yeah, oh, good, okay. So um, she was reviewing these videos uh, that were done by another instructor and they kept referring to the joint commission as Jayco. Oops. Any of you know Jayco? Jayco? No. Okay, yeah, they stopped I, I being- I can't say anything. Huh? I can't say anything. Why? It's actually, it's actually where I work. Oh, you work for do the Joint really? Commission? <laughs> yes, then you of all people should know that they changed their name to yeah, the Joint Commission like, in 2007. Yeah, that's super right? old, yeah. Right, you can say something. You can and you should. I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's interesting that I learned something. I read something the other day that said, to be kind, you should never correct other people when they make a mistake. And I guess it's the teacher in me, but I cannot, I don't care who you are. You could be my best friend. You could be, I, I, if you're my student, you can be sure I'm gonna tell you that you made a mistake. But I just, I mean, we work in healthcare, accuracy, it's number one. Okay, so yes, if somebody calls you, oh, you work for JCO, you need to say, I work for the Joint Commission, TJC, no longer JCAHO. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> it's only been 15 years, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, all right. So interoperability, yes, the data must be able to be shared. All right. Now, a certain someone whose name I'm not going to mention may happen to know that the Joint Commission has a rule about using abbreviations in a facility, right? And they happen to say if you're going to, you have to have a, a, a dictionary, one abbreviation, one definition that everybody knows in this facility. Why? Because in healthcare, we have gazillions of abbreviations and acronyms, and they mean multiple things. 
So when we talk about interoperability, a lot of time we're talking about one computer talking to another computer, but I also want you to think about one human being communicating with another human being. Because that's what we do. Particularly, that's what we do. In the whole hospital, we're the ones in charge of that. And we have to make sure that everybody understands. Okay. All right. Data management. This is always a stickler for me because it's not anything that I touch, but you may have questions about what a data warehouse is, what a data dictionary is, what a data set is, what data mining is. You think I'm going to tell you now, don't you? I'm not. <laughs> You got to go look it up, read it for yourself. No, seriously, because sometimes when you make that extra effort to Google it, um, it, it will stick in your head much better. OK, all right. And indexes. We have the master patient index, the MPI. Most of you probably know about that. You know about the charge master also sometimes referred to as CDM, Charge Description Master. There are also most hospitals will have a disease index, a physician index, and an operation index, which basically is a list of these things that are happening in this facility only. It can be good reference material. Okay, so any questions at this point? All right, you ready to play a game? Oh, I remember that movie. Elliot, do you want to play a game? All right, I went to the trouble of, I don't, no, not that one. Wait a second. Cancel, cancel that. Where's my cancel button? I, this is the first time I've ever done this. So you have to give me a second. Oh, this is what I need to do. Um, hang on. Okay. Can you see this Jeopardy board? No. no. Okay. Now let's try. There we go. Yay. Okay. I see oh, a hyperlink. Okay, oh, there, yep, there it is. There it is. Yeah. yeah. Cuz in Zoom it's it I don't know, but yes. And I even practiced this for you guys. Okay, Ms. Flag. Um I want you to play along. All right, we're not really actually keeping score, but this hopefully you'll find it's fun and reinforcing information that um, you have heard about at some point in your education or your career, especially within the last 45 minutes, you never know. You never know. So Ms. Flagg, will you pick our first category and amount? Health records content for $100. Excellent. All right. A document that expresses patients' wishes for care when they cannot speak for themselves. I did not mention this, by the way. Advanced directive or oh, a living will. There you go. Excellent. Yay. <laughs> okay. That is the correct answer. What is a living will? And you can use this and practice yourself, by the way. Okay. All right. Let's see. Um, Kristen. Yes, ma'am. Pick a, cate a category and an amount. We're just going to stay on health records for 200. Excellent. All right. This acknowledgement signed by a patient is required by HIPAA's privacy rule. I know you know the answer, but shush, they need to practice. <laughs> the clock. Uh, I'm not honestly sure. Anybody else want to try? I don't know. Go ahead. 
uh, informed consent or expressed consent? No, that's not required. Oh, I see what, oh, and I have a typo. Okay, uh, no, you're close, but this is specifically acknowledgement required by HIPAA's privacy rule. Uh, to share information about yeah. their personal health. <laughs> no, <laughs> Informed that's good, consent. but no. NPP? NPP. The privacy practices, acknowledgement of receipt of privacy policies. Oh, okay. She's just showing off because she's a teacher too, but that's why we're teachers. Then you can become <laughs> a teacher too. All right, next, let's go with Kristen. Yes, are we gonna go me again? Oh, you, no, you again. Okay, um, Ms. Smith. Um, so when we are, Yes, to pick when we're supposed to answer, huh? Um, how about data quality for 100? <laughs> okay, good. The data has no errors, no typos, no misinterpretations, also known as validity. That's correct. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> now um, think about, think about the, the list that I shared with you. It's accurate. Sounds like it to me. <laughs> it's perfect. It's <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. And next, I, I'm sorry, Lauren. Lee, I remember your name starts with an L. Mrs. Jacob. Heather. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that starts with an L. Okay. <laughs> um, let's do data quality for two hundred. Excellent choice. The data is available to those who need it when it is needed. That's a really good question. I thank you very much. I made it up myself. And the answer is, what is accessibility? accessibility. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes. Okay, see, you know, I went over all that stuff and you're looking at those lists and you're going, I know that, I know that, I know that. Okay, but that's why we practice. <laughs> all right, Gina. Shh. Um, data management for 100. Cool. Oh, sorry, awesome. I got that. <laughs> also known as a clinical repository, this is a single database that connects multiple databases, which can use a single query and reporting function. I'll give you a hint. It's one of the things I did. I mentioned mm -hmm. and told you to go look up yourself. I think I walked away at that point. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody else want to try? Data warehouse. Yeah, data Very warehouse. Very good. Data yes, data warehouse. That's perfect. Okay, Ms. Flag. Let me have classification systems for three hundred dollars. Ooh. The code set used to report what procedures were provided by the hospital to an inpatient. Oh, PCS coding. Exactly correct. ICD-10 PCS, Procedure Coding System. Woo -hoo. Excellent. <laughs> Heather. Um, let's do classification systems for 400. Whoa. We're getting the big bucks now. This code set is used to report DMEPOS, oh, which stands for Durable Medical, medical equipment, equipment, Prosthetics, Orthotics, and Supplies. Come on, you got it. Is it HICPIC codes? Yay! Good job. Excellent. You get $400, which I do not have. Okay, <laughs> I'm just Monopoly saying. Money. Monopoly money. Monopoly money. Okay, Kristen. Let's go for data information knowledge for 100. Excellent. A number or character with no specific definition or meaning. Uh, 
I know we went over it. Yes, we did. I even gave you an example. <laughs> I don't know. Like 103. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. like 100. And then yeah. if you put the degrees behind it, 100 degrees Fahrenheit, they have a temperature. Yeah, data something. That's data. it, data, That's not it, data, data something, just data. I know it's hard, right? As you think, it is. and you think you're only remembering part of it. I understand that. Get over it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> and Ms. Smith. Uh, so my L is for Laura. Um, oh, Laura. Okay. See, I knew there was an L. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Um, uh, how about? Oh my gosh, health record content for five hundred. Woo. Five hundred. The biggest documentation of lifestyle behaviors that may impact a patient's health, such as smoking uh -huh. or alcohol consumption. It was that thing that had the word social in it with the four letters. <laughs> but social only history. the social part. Oh, only. OK. And this the is social Jeopardy, history. So you, then. Have to, you have to form your answer in the form. Of what the is question. social history? Yay! See? Excellent! Okay. Kristen. Let's go. Classification for 100. The code set used to report why the patient requires the care of a healthcare professional. Uh, what is diagnosis code? That's very good. And what's the name of that code set? Uh, ICD-9, ICD-10, ICD-10. 10 what? Yeah. 10 uh, CM. Yeah. Remember, we have ICD-10 CM and ICD-10 PCS. OK. Yes. Good job. You good job. You guys are doing great. You want to keep going and clear the board or? It doesn't matter. Oh, um, such I will need to sign off at like 630. So we can. OK. All right. So we shall. Oh. Or actually 730 your time. 730. Let's do okay. data information and knowledge for 500. Okay, data information and knowledge for 500. Documentation states that the physician ordered the application of a cast after viewing the x-ray of the patient's ulna is an example. What is? Radiology. What is what? Radiology. No. The answer has to be data, information, or knowledge. Knowledge. Excellent. What is knowledge? knowledge. You got to remember the category as well as the question. Right. OK, it's fine. All right, let's clear the 500s. Classification okay. systems. This code set used to report dental procedures owned and maintained by the American Dental Association. Anybody? Mm. No clue. CDT. What mm -hmm. is clinical dental terminology? I told you it was hard. Well, the five, oops, sorry, the 500s. All right, data quality. The data is up to date and current. One of you asked me about this. Um. I remember talking about it. Okay. It's one of those categories. Timeliness. Timeliness. <laughs> I know it's kind of like a little embarrassing when the word is like so obvious, right? But but that's what your brain does. Whoops, that's what your brain brain does. And one more data management for 500 using current and historical data to learn from patterns and trends to support decision-making at both the patient and business level. What is
based on medical history? No, this is data management. Oh. Okay, so when I retire from teaching, I'm going to go get a job writing <laughs> questions for Jeopardy. Okay. The, the answer is, what is data, data analytics? Oh. Okay, it's all right. The one of the points that we wanted to bring home or cross with this, not only to hopefully have a little fun with learning, but also to enable you to remember that as you're studying for the exam, you want to be able to look at the information in different environments. We get used to like looking at a list, accuracy, timeliness, completeness. And when you take one of them out of the list, it all of a sudden becomes strange. So we want to make sure that that just underscores what I said before about wanting you to um, wanting you to make sure that you understand the concepts that we're going over so that when you are reading those questions on the exam, you will be able to look at that knowledge in that P, not the whole pod, if that helps you at all, okay? Um, and don't worry, this is only week one. You have time, but a little bit every day or as many days as you can is going to be much more beneficial to you than thinking, well, if I take the exam in July, I can start studying the end of June, okay? Don't think that way because it's not the best. And all of this, excuse me, all of this information is information you're going to need on the job at one point or another. So there really is value to you understanding this information. So reminder, at some point, whenever you can afford the $49 or see if you can get your boss to pay for it, I, I don't know, but whatever. Whenever you can afford the $49, go ahead and join AHIMA, the student membership. It's, we pay, full price is like $150 and you get the exact same benefits. So it makes sense. And if for no other reason, you get the discount on the RHIA exam, so it'll pay for itself right away, all right? And then mark your calendars, because next week for week two, we're going to Monday evenings. Monday, May 9th at 6.30 p.m. will be our next live session, okay? Mm -hmm. So... So point of clarification, these sessions are all about review and preparation for the exam? Yes, but not only these sessions, this entire course is focused on that. Okay, so it's kind of covering the concepts of the course and helping prepare for the exam. Okay. The course is designed to help you prepare for the exam. Okay. The, and if you, if you don't think that this is worth your while, we're not going to get insulted. Actually, you've probably noticed that none of your other classes have done these live sessions. Right. And, and no, it's not required. And no, you don't get points to your grade on this. We are, we are doing this, Ms. Flagg and I are doing this to help you reinforce to reinforce the information to help you prepare for the RHIA. Okay. Everybody does things in their own way. Everybody studies the way they do. Everybody gets prepared for something like this the way they do. Um, we're here to work with you and how okay. you want to do it. Uh, we came up with the idea of doing these live sessions to see if you felt it added something to the practice questions on the, from the textbook and, and the other assignments and the discussions. But if not, that's okay too. Okay. So okay. you think about it, you let us know. And, um, 
that's all I have to say. I know it's amazing. <laughs> you didn't think I could run out of things to say. <laughs> I know, Ms. Flagg, you have something to say? <clears throat> Just thank you all for joining. Thank you for your participation and know that we're here for you. So we look forward to seeing you next week if you can join. Thank you. All right, thank okay. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining us. Bye, thank you.